I'm really interested in making myself into something that is uh, consumable. <laughs> you know, so what does that mean? You know, what, what, what do I look like then? You know, I look like myself and I'm still, you know, I could argue that, you know, people do consume each other in their normal selves, but is there a way to heighten uh, the, the body so that it's uh, elevated from just being a dancing body to an art object. I would love to be able to do this on the street. I'm kind of afraid of being on the street. <laughs> but I would love to be able to see like in Times Square, can I just plonk myself in Times Square? And st in, 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 especially in rush hour, people are just kind of doing their thing because in some ways that's the environment I'm trying to create inside of people mailing around, um, you know, I mean, granted that inside people slow down a little bit more, they aren't rushing to catch a train. The audience will simply be standing, will come in and stand and be able to walk around, walk around me. And so, so creating a three dimensional, well, which it is already three dimensional, four dimensional relationship between myself and the audience, um, that mobility, fluidity of the space and yet I'm rooted to one spot. It's a hundred year anniversary of the, the original Rite of Spring, um, a work that you have to study in any school. <laughs> like it is one of those masterpieces that I um, uh, had to know kind of inside and out. I love it. I, I really have a huge fascination with um, any human being's power to create something that then shifts a whole way of thinking, you know, like, uh, so the Rite of Spring did that both as, um, as a movement um, uh, journey, you know, Nijinsky, but also as a sound journey with Stravinsky. Uh, and I'm also fascinated by the fact that at this point in, 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 uh, in human history, uh, in Europe, primitivism was the biggest, uh, you know, thinking uh, happening in an and art movement. Um, so anybody who was anybody was looking at the primitive other and trying to, you know, because industrialization uh, had brought them to a certain place and they started to feel like they were not connected to the land. So anything that felt as if it was connected to the land was very much the, the Vogue, so whether it was Josephine Baker, or it was the Russians, or it was Picasso in his studio with the African masks, that was what was happening. So for that reason, I am even doubly interested in the Rite of Spring, because then I, if I were put to, you know, I am that primitive other, I am that, you know, fascination, that exotic uh, other. So I am interested in, what if I take on that 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 uh, project to um, to to talk back to this uh, uh, era of you know honoring everything that's exotic, revealing and not revealing, mm -hmm. um, and or playing with a stereotype being African, hmm. <laughs> which I think you know anybody who goes to Africa knows like that's so not true. Like, see that in like, <laughs> in the rural, like in, yeah, oh, and even in the rural areas you have to like go <laughs> so far to find anybody walking around with no shirt on. Mm -hmm. But no, I, I did see that in Burkina Faso and I was like, but look at that woman, she has no shirt on, yay! And they're like, she's not well. <laughs> <laughs> Can't you see she's not well? It still lingers, uh, the othering, the exoticizing. And I am always aware that as an African woman, uh, that that question surrounds me, surrounds my work, you know? And I know that as hard as uh, uh, people are working to not associate, you know, all that history uh, with the thing they're seeing, it's, it's inevitable. You know, it's it's inevitable, and and also if I say Zimbabwe, you know, the, you know the whole conversation starts to get complicated. Um, so that complication 
is really an interesting tension that I think I have in my body, and especially in relationship to this particular European um, masterpiece. Uh, but then even going a little bit further from the Russians, the primitivism, um, the othering, uh, it's, it's uh, the way this work shifted uh, thinking forever. Um, I am you know, curious about these themes of sacrifice and offering. Is the artist the chosen one to be you know, surrendered for the good of the all? Is the performance itself the offering? So I am interested in how art is consumed and especially how dance is consumed. You know, um, if you go, uh, visual artists sell the visual object. Uh, dancers have to sell their bodies. You know, I mean, we don't like to use that, those kind of uh, words, that kind of language, um, because it is hurtful and it is impolite. <laughs> and it is also incorrect in this day and age. But really, the truth is that's what's happening. You know, uh, why do you choose to go see this one and not the other? You, you know, you're making really uh, uh, choices about taste, about what you would like to associate yourself with. Um, you know, so that idea of the artist, of myself, Nora Chibame, as the object, which is also subject, uh, you know, uh, is very interesting to me. And then creating a work that is an offering for the good of the community. Somebody needs to be sacrificed for the good of the community. That's what the, uh, the, this ritual of spring is about. But I want to take it away from that pagan sort of setting, which I think for me would be really easy uh, to kind of <laughs> to create a ritual in the bush that is completely authentic, unauthentic, you know, like I think I, 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 I could really pull off a very uh, sort of honest looking <laughs> ritual set in the, in the, uh, uh, in the savannah somewhere. But I'm, I'm not particularly interested in that interpretation because it is also too close to the original um, uh, Russian uh, version. Um, but yeah, looking at myself as the performer and looking at the work that I'm making as the offering is sort of how I've sort of distilled this question of what is sacrifice and what is an offering. So in, in some ways I'm trying to, how do I make this happen? Uh, if the audience is uh, participating in this ritual, you know, they are, there is no supporting cast. Uh, you know, so Nijinsky's cast was huge, and you have the elders, you have the young, young maidens, <laughs> and then somebody gets chosen, and everybody, you know, so there isn't any supporting cast. It's myself, but I think the supporting cast for me and my interpretation, uh, which I'm now calling right, cross it out, riot, um, is the audience. So the audience, uh, I have to find a really smart way <laughs> of engaging the audience. So one idea that we're exploring is, um, you know, having no chairs that the audience are able to just walk around and stand in the room and all, you know, be in such close proximity with me that you know touching is really possible. And what if I were to go even further and invite them to touch? You know, because I mean I go to museums and I want to touch the thing. <laughs> uh, but then there are all these signs and all ropes and you know maybe elect electrical wires <laughs> that sort of prevent you from getting very close to the art object. Uh, so I'm thinking, you know, what if we had no, you know, ropes and all oh, other things preventing people from getting very close to me? And oh, even going further and saying, you can touch me, you know, while I'm doing this, um, this, 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 this performance ritual. So perhaps in allowing people to touch me and removing the barrier between the audience and the performer, um, this, uh, this uh, ritual, the right, uh, is happening, you know, and I'm hoping it becomes kind of chaotic enough to justify a riot.
So often the loud music that I'm playing is either, you know, Southern African or specifically Zimbabwean or Africa in general. In the early stages of thinking, I, I, I like to have the space sort of filled with, um, uh, with that memory of, of home, uh, of, of, my, of my skin. <laughs> um, but then eventually that sound disappears and uh, in comes the sound that I believe is going to represent uh, the piece that I'm making. So for instance, today when you walked in, we're uh, working with Philip, uh, who's designing sound, Philip White over there, and he's listening to the talking head. So um, we're having this discussion about, uh, you know, punk, the evolution of punk, um, and where it's at now. Uh, but also in high school, I was dancing a lot to the talking head. You know, so that's a point uh, where we're starting with this, uh, you know, um, with the sound that will accompany this piece. Um, but also to be allowed to have an assistant in the studio, to have a, a dramaturg or whoever I wanted, you know, I'm able to have two people working with me. It's Catherine Profeta. She's a dramaturg and she's working um, as both a choreographic advisor and our dramaturgy, you know, everything. We kind of collapse all roles really because it, it, it's such an intimate space that everybody starts to do everything. I think the Joyce should just get the humanitarian award or something. It's fantastic. It's, it's so, it's so life-giving, uh, you know, because, I, and I kind of don't take it for granted because you have follow years and then you have, you know, productive years. And so to be allowed to continue to be productive um, is, is uh, really uh, important. And I also, I'm in mid-career now, and I feel like that's kind of where um, things fall apart <laughs> because you're no longer young and maybe as exciting. And, you know, people want to know what you're doing next. People think they kind of know what you stand for and what you're doing sort of in mid-career and maybe you've earned enough not to need that much support. I, I, I like to just work with the, uh, the sound of my own voice, of my own breathing. Uh, and so shutting out uh, recorded music um, and allowing myself to hear what my own breathing uh, rhythms are and hopefully sometimes accentuating that you know and or exaggerating uh, the sound of my own breath uh, but also maybe even going a little bit further so uh, what if that uh, that breath became uh, <gasps> A, a, a musical kind of sound, like, you know, how does that feel? And I'm trying to understand what's happening muscularly as I'm making that kind of sound. And then hopefully remembering it that that muscular ex action doesn't get lost in the, in, in, in the aesthetic of the piece. Uh, so, you know, the, the physical language that I'm interested in now is really what is most organic what is most human, uh, what is closest to where I've been, or, or you know, what is closest to the skin that I wear, uh, and as far away from the academic, uh, you know, sort of formal world uh, as possible. trying to put my chest on the ceiling. Oh 